Proverbs chapter 31 and to a very familiar chapter. And I usually refrain from preaching that on Mother's Day, but God led me this passage today. And uh, I'll be speaking to you on the subject, the composite of a Christ-honoring woman. And I think we find it here in Proverbs chapter 31. It's an acrostic, uh, verses 10 through 31 of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters. And uh, basically, it's not a, a to-do list. And uh, some ladies, boy, if you, if, you, if you thought of it as that way, you'd think, man, I'll never measure up with Proverbs 31 if it's, you know, if I got to do everything. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a to-do list. It's a composite of what a woman who honors Jesus Christ uh, is and does. And uh, not necessarily what she looks like on the outside, but what she is on the inside. And uh, I want to give you, and this is a, a, a funnier uh, poem, and I, I read this probably six, five, or six years ago, and uh, it's time, if it was good enough to read the first time, it should be good enough to read the second time, amen. And, uh, and this is not a Bible, um, you know, this, they didn't pull this from the Bible, so if you say, Pastor, that doesn't sound exactly right, this is not Bible here, okay? When God created mothers, when the good Lord was creating mothers, he was into his sixth day of overtime. When the angel appeared and said, you're doing a lot of fiddling around on this one. God doesn't do any fiddling around, okay? But just for the sake of this story. God said, have you read the specs on this order? She has to be completely washable but not plastic. Have 180 movable parts, all replaceable. Run on black coffee and leftovers. (laughs) Have a lap that disappears when she stands up. (laughs) And a kiss that can cure anything and six pairs of hands. The angel shook her head slowly and said, six pairs of hands, no way. It's not the hands that are causing me problems, God remarked. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers have to have. That's on the standard model, asked the angel. God nodded. One pair that sees through closed doors when she asked, what are you kids doing in there? When she already knows. Another here in the back of her head that sees what she shouldn't, but what she has to know. And of course, the ones here in the front that can look a child in the eyes when he goofs up and say, I understand and I love you without so much as uttering a word. God said the angel, touching his sleeve gently, get some rest tomorrow. I can't say, God, I'm close to creating something Uh, wonderful. Already I have one who heals herself when she's sick can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger and can get a nine-year-old to stand under a shower. (laughs) The angel circled the model of a mother very slowly. It's too soft, she sighed, but tough, said God. You can imagine what this mother can do or endure. Finally, the angel bent over and ran her finger across the cheek. There's a leak, she pronounced. I told you that you were trying to put too much in this model. It's not a leak, said God. It's a tear. What's it for? It's for joy, sadness, disappointment, pain, loneliness, and pride. You're a genius, said the angel. Somberly, God said, I didn't put it there. Certainly, sin brought pain and heartache. And uh, motherhood is a wonderful thing. And I think it needs to be elevated in our day. Not just motherhood, but what is a God-fearing, Christ-honoring lady? What does she look like? What does she look like? And I, I dare say that our world has not a clue uh, what, what she looks like. And that they don't have any idea uh, what, what she looks like. And, you know, Mother's Day for many um, can, be, can be tough. We certainly want to honor and magnify motherhood. I believe that's what we ought to do. I believe the Bible does that. But also, I'm aware that Mother's Day can, uh, can bring a difficult time for some. Uh, maybe you want to be a mother, but you can't be for some reason. Maybe, you know, it's quite possible you're in conflict with your mom and your memories of her right now are not so good. Perhaps you've recently lost your mother and you're grieving her. Some of you mothers have lost a child to death. Some of you mothers feel the pain of a wayward child this morning, right now. If you're a mom, maybe you feel some guilt about how you raised your kids. 
Some of you can't have children and you're hurting about that. Others of you aren't married and you wish you were. And some of you are flying solo as you work hard to nurture your child's faith and raise them in a way that would be pleasing to God. This is not meant to bring pain to you, but it's meant to honor mothers and honor the Lord. By the time a child reaches 18, a mother has had to handle some extra 18,000 hours of child-generated work. In fact, women who never have children enjoy the equivalent of an extra three months of year a year in leisure time. That's a thought. Some of you would like to have that three, three months back, right? All right, enough of the kidding. Proverbs 31.1, all right? The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, the mother of a reigning king, was always regarded with the... Uh, the uh, um, let's get back to the Bible. The words... I got my notes mixed up in there. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, uh, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. Now, um, really... It was, it was more thought of in Bible days to be the mother uh, of a king than it was to be the wife of a king. Motherhood was highly regarded and revered, and so, it's, so it should be today. In, in our culture, in our day, uh, motherhood is cheapened. Uh, being a godly mother, being a mother who's there for their children uh, is cheapened, looked down upon, frowned upon. But I say to you, God in his word elevates the position of motherhood. And God has placed you in a specific strategic place if you are here today and you call yourself a mother. God has given you a position to influence the next generation for his honor and his glory. Don't ever look down. Don't ever think little or belittle your own self uh, because of the jeers and sneers of culture or other uh, ladies. Uh, you raise your head and be proud if somebody calls you mother. It's a wonderful thing to be called a mother. I want you to look down in verse 10. We began the dialogue about what a godly mother, the composite of a Christ-honoring woman. Verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. You know, it's hard to estimate the value of a mother. But just to give you an idea, salary.com just released, this was several years ago, a study and uh, if, you, if you put together the, the jobs that a stay-at-home mom does in the United States, if she was paid for her work as a housekeeper, cook, daycare center teacher, laundry machine operator, van driver, facilities manager, janitor, computer operator, chief, chief executive officer, and psychologist, she would earn $138,000 a year. Hmm. <laughs> I thought that would get one. Thank you. A mother who holds full-time work outside the home would earn an additional $86,000 for the work she does at home. So in a nutshell, I'm sure we are, we are undervaluing our, our mothers. Who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. Verse 11, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Verse 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Now I want us to see the what makes up a Christ honoring woman. We see her hands here and then uh, in verse in verse 13 she works willingly uh, with her hands. Uh, we see that she's willing to work and she takes delight in her duties and uh, she, she likes to, to be busy and to work and to do things and uh, God blesses a woman or a man that works. God honors labor in the Bible. Uh, God never puts a premium on being lazy. So verse 13, the latter part, and worketh willingly with her hands. Now look at verse number 22, if you would. Verse 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and pur purple. So she's working. She's making coverings here. Verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it. So she's, she's working. Verse 15 says she doesn't get much sleep. And all the ladies said amen on that one. 
Verse 15, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So she gets up while it's still dark. She does, uh, does her work. Turn over to Isaiah chapter number 40, if you would. Isaiah chapter number 40. I want you to see a verse here. Isaiah chapter number 40. Isaiah chapter number 40. And we'll look down at verse number 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. You know, some of you, some of you moms right now, you, you, your hands are tired. <laughs> And uh, you, you have small children and, and you're wore out. I'm glad at times like that God says and gives uh, commendation here to the shepherd that, hey, he'll reach down and help you and comfort you and strengthen you. How many of you have kids that are grown today? Would you raise, and by grown, I mean like old enough to do stuff. How many of you wonder how in the world you made it through when they were little? I mean... Just, I don't know how. I, I, I wonder right now. We had three under the age of two, and uh, I don't know how I did it. And I didn't, I didn't drink alcohol, and I didn't drink NyQuil either, all right? And uh, that's, I guess that's the Christian substitute for alcohol is NyQuil. Now, neither of the above. <laughs> but uh, David was on oxygen for two years, and every night in my life, just about, I had him in my left hand laying off the couch because he wouldn't be still. And uh, I'd hold him with that oxygen cord um, in his nose and hold him in my left hand and sleep on the couch for a lot of nights. I don't recommend sleeping on the couch. I hate it. I ain't going to do it unless I have to. But sometimes you got to do things. Amen. Amen. But I promise you, as soon as I could get back in there with my wife, I did. Amen. And let me just say, it's not good for, for a man and woman to be sleeping in two different places. That, that's, that's right in a lot of ways right there. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about that one for a minute. And, um, but you do what you got to do. You know, I'm glad God, when in those moments, moms, it's worth it. I know you don't see it now, and I know that they don't give you the accolades you deserve. And as, as the book of Proverbs tells us in this chapter at the end, uh, to, to give honor and to praise them. Listen, you don't get what you deserve, but I promise you there's a God in heaven that's watching every moment of what you do. He knows what you do. He keeps good records. He sees the sleepless nights. He sees the tears. He sees the prayers. He sees all that you uh, put into being who God made you to be and in those moments when you think I just can't go another mile I can't pick up another this I can't go another time here I can't I just can't do this anymore God said in Isaiah he says hey the chief shepherd will pick up the little shepherd that's caring for a family I'll pick you up and I'll carry you and I'll take care of you and God will certainly do that for you and I'm thankful for the Lord giving us strength because as you look back, you think, my goodness, and I've looked at my mom and I've looked through things that she's went through and thought, how in the world did she make it? God did it. You've looked at yours and said, I don't know how in the world she made it. And uh, when you go finding out, you ought to take a day and go ask her about her childhood sometime. Ask, you ought to know how your mama grew up. And uh, that's not to worship mama. We don't worship uh, anybody but Jesus Christ. But y'all to know, y'all to know what they've been through. Y'all to know her story. It'll shock you. It'll surprise you to see the grace that God gave to your mother. So we see she doesn't get much sleep. Her light's not going out anytime soon. In verse 17, look at it. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She works hard. She works hard. Uh, you know, God has no time for lazy people. Amen. Men or women. Gentlemen, you ought, to, you ought not be lazy. Your wife ought not ever have a second thought of whether or not you're lazy. And ladies, same goes for you. Amen. God's people ought not be lazy people. And, uh, and if, you don't, if you want to know if you're lazy or not, just ask your spouse. They'll tell you. <laughs> Just ask them. Verse 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold uh, the distaff 
And she's working here. Verse 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. In other words, she, she's busy. She's going after it. Uh, she's, she's doing stuff, and uh, she's, not, she's not idle. And that describes most moms in here this morning, her hands. Number two, I want us to see her help, her help. You know, I guess most men, most women would want a little more help around the house. How many of you ladies would say, right? Okay, good. And uh, Susan's giving me all the help I need this morning, isn't she? I appreciate that. We see her help. And uh, most women would like to have some help around the house. Uh, many of you, most of you feel like you do it all. And a woman was, was kind of trying to get some help from her husband. So she called from the office and asked her husband to help with supper. She said, can you help make dinner? When she arrived home, she found her husband on the couch watching ESPN. And so she got angry and she said, I thought you said you was going to make something for supper. To which he replied, I did make dinner. I made a pasta salad and the directions told me to chill one hour before serving. <laughs> That's not the kind of help you need, right? <laughs> Back to the help she gives, never, never one time was this woman... Um, said never one time did she do anything really for herself. She's attentive to others. Look at verse number 12, if you would. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. If you're married this morning, your husband, and if you're going to be married, your husband ought to be able to trust you. He ought to be able to trust you. She helps everybody she comes in contact with here, this Proverbs 31 woman. He's not wondering if she's down there flirting with somebody at work. Amen. He's not wondering, can he trust her to go to the grocery store without coming back with a date? Amen. He, he's not wondering about that. She, he safely trusted. She did him good, not evil, all the days of her life. Hey, a woman's impact on the home, it, it ought to be good. You ought not be known as a home wrecker, but a home builder. A home builder. She helps. Everything she touches, it's always about somebody else. Helping, helping, helping. Her family's needs are met. Look at verse 15. Talking about her help now. She riseth also while it is yet night, giveth meat to her household. And who else? And a portion to her maidens. She took care of her family. She took care of those that she was responsible for. Even the people she had helping, she took care. She took care of him. Verse 16, she considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. So verse 16 tells us she bought a field in order to better what? Better feed her family. Verse 27 says she, she watches over basically the, the, the affairs of her household. She looketh well to the ways of her household. So she, she engages her mind. She strategically follows a plan to, to build and try to help build and do what God wants her to do uh, in the home. She's, she's never idle. She's an entrepreneur in the field of building her house and her children and her husband. That's her business. Her business is not out doing something just for herself. Her business is taking care of her family. Now, she, she did work. She worked. And uh, you said, Pastor, is it okay for a woman to work outside the home? I believe the picture here is uh, she did what's best for her family, but her primary, her primary focus was her family and not uh, her, her career. Amen. Her primary focus was her family. That was it. Then we see in verse 26, about talking about helping here, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is a law of kindness. She wasn't merely a good housewife attending to, to these uh, diligently to the material needs and interests. She guided her family with words of wisdom. She guided her family with her mouth. When she spoke, it wasn't gossip. It wasn't slander. It wasn't idle talk. She uttered um, sentences of prudence and wisdom to her family. One thing you ought to be known for, mamas, ladies, you ought to be known for a woman out of whose mouth is wisdom. 
Not one that talks about everybody in town. Not one that's wanting to know everybody's business. Not one that's interested in what everybody else is doing. Not interested in gossiping and talking down about people and talking about people and tearing up everything she can come in contact with her tongue. But this woman had a mouth that built people. I mean, if you could see what she built, there is no stadium in the United States that would compare to the building that this woman in Proverbs 31 built. How did she build it, Pastor? She built it with her mouth. She built it with her tongue. Oh, how many lives we can shape and mold and, uh, and, and direct with, with our tongue. And she, she opened her mouth. What came out? Wisdom came out. Not gossip, not slander, but Wisdom. Well, we'd all do well to open our mouth and wisdom fly out. And that doesn't come natural, by the way. It takes the Holy Spirit of God on the inside, working in our hearts. She ministered grace to her hearers. She did. And I thank God for that. And then we ought to, we ought to strive to do it uh, in our tongue. Was this the law of kindness? Um, her language to those around her was animated and regulated by love, by love. Ladies, are your words regulated by love? Not only her hands, her help, number three, I want us to see the most important part. Look at verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. It's a wise woman who knows that true beauty comes from a holy heart. Her hands, important. Her help, important. But her heart was the most important. The most important thing you can hand down, the most notable thing that you can give to your children, your grandchildren, your husband, is a heart that's wholly in love with Jesus Christ and totally devoted to him and focused on him and adoring him and adorning the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most worthy thing you can hand anybody, ladies, is a heart given over to God. Totally holy. Not part, but the whole. The most beautiful thing about a woman is the heart given to God. And this Proverbs 31 woman had a heart that was given unto the Lord. Her, her identity did not come from outer beauty. It did not come from Maybelline and mascara. Her beauty uh, came, and by the way, I'm for those things. But her identity did not come because she was a soccer mom. It did not come because of her makeup. Her identity did not come because of uh, the things she was involved in and the things she organized and the things she got done. Her identity came from an inner encounter with the almighty God. And you'll never be the lady, we'll never be the men, the daddies, the mamas, the children, the grandchildren that we should be until we have an encounter with the Almighty God. It's not about who we know in the sense of of earthly uh, friendships. It's not about what we know in the sense of knowledge and ingenuity. It's about an encounter with Jesus Christ. You say, I want to be the right mom. I want to be the right dad then you must be right with God. You'll never have right relationships horizontally until you put preeminence on the relationship vertically. And that is with Jesus Christ. So I say to you this morning, the most important thing is not how many people follow your blog. It's not how many people buy stuff from you. It's not how many times you can make trips back and forth to the school uh, in the way you do it. That's not the most notable thing about your life. The most notable thing should be about you is that you walk with God. You walk with God. I mean, if there's anything said about you, it ought to be the spirit with which you love and adore Jesus Christ. Nothing else. It ought to be your heart. And by the way, it will shine through. If Jesus lives on the inside and he has preeminence in your life, you won't have to wear pins. You won't have to broadcast. You won't need a loud speaker. You won't need a bullhorn. Everybody around will see that meek and quiet spirit in 1 Peter 3. He said, "Don't, don't worry about the outside and the hair and all that, he said, hey, it's important, but be, be careful. It's that 
inner beauty. What is it? You look it up when you get home. That meek and quiet spirit is the heart. It's the heart. You know, if we need anything in this world, what will change a nation? God's people having a heart, an encounter with him, and having a heart for God, a heart that's consumed by what God wants us to do. Her heart, her heart was right. And you know, we live in a culture that's obsessed with the external. As I, as I mentioned, 1 Peter 3, 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair, of wearing gold, or of putting on of apparel. Did say don't do that, but don't focus on that. I think you ought to look the best you can. There's no, there's no premium on not looking right. Gentlemen, that goes for you too. Take a shower. They make deodorant for a reason. Amen. I'm a man. I sweat. Well, wonderful. They make stuff for that. You don't put a premium on nasty. God, God wants us to be, I mean, I, I believe that. It says the temple of the Holy Spirit. We ought to take of it more ways and take care of it in more ways than one. But I believe you ought to look the best you can. Husbands, you owe it to your wives uh, to, to look the best you can. Well, she married me. This is what she got. Like it or lump it. Well, there's some things you could do, like, you know, sit in scalding hot water for about three hours. It'll help that. <laughs> they make that, that go-go, that orange stuff to put on your hands. It'll take grease off. Amen. What is that stuff? It's not that. What is it? What is it, Mitchell? It is go-go, isn't it? Go-jo. Go-go. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Let's get off of that, okay? Uh, go-jo. <laughs> some of you need some of that. Amen. And, uh, you know, we, we, ought to, we ought to do the best we can. Ladies, you, you, ought, to, you ought to present yourself. The best you can with what God's given you. I believe that. You ought to be modest. You ought to look right. More than all that, I don't care what kind of bag you're carrying. I'm not going to look at the name of your bag. I'm going to see something long before I see that Michael Kors coming. You know what it is? Right here. Heart. Heart. Is it holy? Given to Jesus Christ. That's the important thing. May God help us. And then when, when women and men cultivate a heart that worships a holy God, especially women, they realize their purpose is wrapped up in their identity. You know who you are this morning? If you're saved, your purpose is wrapped up in your identity. You are a daughter of the king. You're a daughter of the king. Why? Why does it matter all these things you're talking about? What, what about my heart, Pastor? What about the way? Hey, it matters because you are. Uh, your purpose is wrapped up in your identity. That's who you are. Your purpose is wrapped up in that because you've been redeemed, because you're a daughter of the king. That is your identity. You don't need to be searching for a new this or a new that or a new way to do this. Hey, those wrinkles will come back. Those things that you don't like, they're going to be there. I promise you till Jesus comes back and they're not going to get any better. But the things that we can work on are is that inward man of the heart. Our identity is not in makeup, mascara, and the outward. Our identity is in in our purpose. We are daughters of the king, ladies. We are sons of God, daughters of God. We ought, to, we ought to walk like it. We ought to act like it. Our hearts ought to be right. So many women are looking for the identity today. So many. You are a daughter of the king if you're saved. If you're not saved, you can be. That is your identity. That ought to be the first thing people see. It's not this or that. They ought not hear names being dropped before they see a heart that's been given to God. And by the way, your position as a mother, and I'm, I'm wrapping up, but your position as a mother is a platform for God's purposes. 
your position as a mother. You say, I, I just, I don't like all this talk about motherhood. Pastor, you're just one of those men that downgrades uh, career and all this. Let me say to you, if it benefits God and your husband and your family, here's, here's, what, here's what I'm for. You're, no matter what you're doing outside the home, no matter what you're doing on your own, no matter what your career is, your most important thing, God has positioned you. He's given you a platform to forward his purposes. You know what that platform is? It's the home. It's home. The platform for, that God wants to use. And you may look down on it. You may look at it and say, oh, I'm just a maid. All I do, yeah, the only reason you say that, I want somebody to pick up your clothes and do your laundry and fix your food and do this. Hey, if you see, if that's all you see, this woman saw more than that. She took care of the heart. And I want to say to you, you have a platform. God has given you a position, a platform right there where you are in your home to influence the next generation and down the line and the next and the next and the next. You have the greatest opportunity known to man to influence the next generation. They're right there at your dinner table. They're right in that high chair. They're in the car seat. You have what nobody else has. You have more time with them than anybody else and you have an opportunity to impact these kids for the glory of God for generations and generations and generations to come. Don't you ever feel second fiddle to somebody else. And you do what you have to do to help your family, but never forget your primary position is there. It's there. By the way, you'll do more good there for the next generation, then you will find the cure for acne. Amen. You'll do more good influencing your kids. I mean, think about it, guys. The things you know, Brother King, all, all of us, the things I know about God and, 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 and we don't even know the prayers that's been prayed for us. I don't know what all my grandmother prayed for. But I know she prayed for me. I know she and she never got to see me do anything for the Lord. I hope she knows about it now. With those prayers, don't go into heated, Mama. You've got the most important post in all the world. May God help us. Have our heart right. I mean, my, my wife will do whatever we need in our home, but I promise you, you know where she's the happiest? She's the happiest right there being my wife and being a mama. That's where she's happiest. Now, she'll do whatever we need done. She's happiest there. And let me say, that's the place of greatest influence. May God help us.